Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church here in Greenville, Tennessee. For all of those that are gathered with us on site and those that are joining us live on both Facebook and YouTube, we want to welcome you this morning as we worship together. I'm Greg Cartwright. I'm one of the pastors here, and I want to share a few announcements with you this morning of several things that are coming up in the life of our church. So uh, let me do that, and uh, then we'll continue on in our time of worship together this morning. First of all, I want to remind folks that this evening... 3 o'clock, 4, 4.30, 3 o'clock is middle school youth, 4 o'clock is crossover, and then 4.30 high school youth. We'll be meeting at our normal times. And I want to say a big thank you to everyone as well for keeping us in your thoughts and prayers last week as we were back at the Resurrection Conference, uh, gathered with thousands of youth over in Pigeon Forge. Uh, it was good to be back after a three-year sort of break because of the pandemic, and uh, it was great to be back in person. So thank you for your thoughts and prayers uh, as we traveled last week as well. Also coming up on Wednesday, February the 8th, speaking of our youth, uh, we are going to have our annual Chili Cook-Off fundraiser. All of those funds go to support our youth. Actually, they're going to be going back uh, to help us recoup some of our money uh, from the resurrection trip this past weekend. Uh, but we are looking forward. This is always a great night of food. If you would like to enter your chili recipe, um, you can sign up with me. I'll, I'll get you set up in a category. And uh, if you are going to attend that night, which we hope all of you will, um, you can just sign up like you normally would, either through the church office or on our webpage. Uh, you can sign up for WFC Dinner and let us know that you're coming. Uh, so we'll make sure that we have plenty of food for everyone. But that's coming up on Wednesday, February the 8th, and we are excited about that event. You're going to be hearing more about that uh, over the week. Also, um, I want to share with folks, um, in your insert, you will find a sign-up uh, for ordering Super Bowl Sunday soup. The Winnie Prue Circle is going to be making soup. There's two opportunities to pick up the soup, uh, those quarts, once they're made. Uh, one is on Friday, February the 10th, and the second is on Sunday, February the 12th. And uh, either one of those days on the 12th, which is probably the day that many people will pick up on that Sunday, uh, you can pick up after both services in the fellowship hall. Uh, so the ladies will be there and you can pick your soups up at that particular time. Um, there's not an insert in your bulletin yet, but you will start seeing one over the next couple of weeks. Uh, coming up on Sunday, February the 26th from 4.30 to 6.30, we're going to have another church-wide bowling night. Um, our first one back during the fall or the beginning of the fall right before school started uh, was such a huge success. Uh, this is intergenerational. We had everyone from children, youth, adults, uh, of all ages. You don't have to bowl. You can just come out and join us, eat some great pizza, um, have some great social time, uh, or you can come out and do all of the above. But we're going to be at Olympia Lanes from 4.30 to 6.30 uh, on February the 26th. You're going to be hearing a lot more about that coming up. Um, I was reminded in first service this morning to remind folks uh, about our food bank um, offerings that we are collecting. Um, we are continuing to collect pasta through the end of January. And then, come next week, once we switch over into February, we're going to be collecting peanut butter. So the drop-off box is downstairs on the first floor uh, in the middle room right directly across, uh, well, sort of perpendicular uh, to the office entrance uh, there in the hallway as well. That's all the announcements that I believe I have, unless you have others, Pastor Todd. All right. Let us continue in our time of worship this morning.
Good morning. Moment for mission is the time during the service where we share with each other the great benefits that the giving from this church makes to this community. And today I'm so very, very proud to introduce to you for today's Moment for Mission, Mr. David Andrew, who is president of the Greene County Wood Ministry. And I'll give it to David to explain who and what he, he uh, is in his community. Thank you, Kid. Well, it is a great pleasure to be here with you this morning. Uh, I always take or have great excitement when I can share about this ministry that uh, reaches all uh, throughout this community, uh, not just Greenville, but the entire county from, from border to border. Um, so we give firewood away to people that need it. So far this year, we have given away, and when I say this year, uh, I'm referring to our heating season that starts the 1st of October, um, and we'll run through April. So, so far this year, we have given away about 1,100 loads of firewood to 273 different households, and of those 273, 57 are new this year. So the three most common questions that I'm asked about the firewood ministry is number one, how does somebody qualify for the firewood? They apply at the food bank. They do all the qualifications and then refer to us the address where the firewood needs to go. Number two, where do you get your wood? It's donated from throughout the community. Uh, people like yourselves, if a tree falls in your yard or you have one cut down or light and power happens to take a tree down along the power right of ways, you can call us. If it's something we can use and if it's within reasonable distance, uh, we will come and gather what we can use for firewood. We do not take the brush. Um, question number three is, how can I help? Um, you can help in a variety, of, a variety of ways. We need volunteers to help cut, split, and deliver. Um, we need donations. Small dollar donations are how we make our living. And uh, by all means, you can help by, as you do, and have done for years, prepare a meal for us on Saturdays when we have our big volunteer days. Um, that is such a blessing for the guys that are working, no matter the weather conditions, to get them inside, let them warm up at noon, and eat a, eat a good meal. And uh, thank you for, for having supported that. Um, we work, the volunteers work uh, Monday through Saturday, typically in the mornings. We start about 8 and try to wrap up around uh, 11.30, 12 o'clock. So if you can't come on Saturday and you can come another morning, feel free to. Um, I'll, I'll end by telling you one of my favorite memories of a delivery to a specific address happened two years ago. A grandmother visited us on a Saturday morning and said, my daughter needs help. She has four girls. The husband has left. The heat pump is out. They have no heat and have not had heat in the house for uh, over a month. So we loaded up a trailer of firewood. I had the pleasure of delivering that. And uh, as I backed in to, to deliver the firewood, all the girls came out of the house, the mother and the four daughters, and they were all dressed as if they were outside in the cold because it was that cold inside the house. I dumped the firewood and as I pulled out of the yard, my window was still down, and in my rearview mirror, I could see the youngest daughter, who was about six or seven. She had clambered up on top of that firewood pile and had turned to her mother and sisters and was making up her own song, singing, We Have Wood, We're Going to Be Warm Tonight. Thank you for this time. David, don't get away just right this minute. From First Presbyterian, we want to give you a, a little donation Thank you. Uh, for the wood minister, and we hope it'll be a down payment on something we can do more as the year goes by. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. I invite you now to join me in our call to worship, our responsive reading this morning. 
We have candles lit at the beginning of worship. The candles aren't for our eyes, they're for our hearts. Yes, we light the candles to remind us that God provides light and warmth for our hearts. Let us open our hearts and minds to God's light. Let us pray. Gracious God, you truly are the light of the world. And we as your people gather because you journey with us. You're with us in times of light and darkness. And as we gather, we open our hearts and minds to all that you have in store. Because we are more than just fans or spectators sitting in a pew but we are participants, a part of all that you have in store for us this day and every day as you seek to help us understand what life is like in being a new creation. So guide our worship this day. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing together hymn number 761. morning. I'm Todd Jenkins, also one of the pastors here, and I want to tell you that we are glad to have all of you, those who are gathered on site and those who are gathered online. Confession is a part of our worship because it is what helps prepare our hearts to receive the scripture as the good news that it was intended to be. 
So we confess our sin because we know that God has promised to forgive us. Remembering that promise, let us dare to join hearts and voices together as we are able, praying the unison prayer of confession found in your bulletin. Let us pray. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, whose face is hidden from us by our sins and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts, cleanse us from all our offenses and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires that with reverent and humble hearts we may draw near to you confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and strength. Through Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Who is in a position to condemn? We are told that there is but one, and he is the very one who does not condemn us. He is the one who was raised for us, the one who reigns in power for us. He is the one who prays for us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel in and through Jesus Christ. We are forgiven. seated. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to be reading verses 18 through 31. So let us listen to and for the word of the Lord. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demanded signs and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards, but many were powerful. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord.
Our second reading for today comes to us from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 5, beginning with the first verse. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. Our third reading for today comes to us from the book of the prophet Micah, chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. 
Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? In what have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt, and I redeemed you from the house of slavery, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shatim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before Him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? This is the word of the Lord. Be I invite you to rise in body and or spirit as we sing together number 769.
Please be seated. The final verse of our Micah passage for today is, I would dare say, clearly the best known verse from the whole book of the prophet Micah. And in it, Micah offers what I call a triple crown. It is a threefold plan for the full arrival and the complete unfolding of the divine plan for all of creation. In this sixth chapter, Micah seems to function as God's attorney in a suit against God's people. It is very interesting to me and quite telling that the jury that Micah names to hear this case between the divine and God's people is made up of the mountains, the hills, and the foundations of the earth. Yes, it is creation itself that will determine whether the accused is convicted or not. And the first narrative that the attorney Micah enters into evidence is an account of God's faithfulness by way of the Exodus. Three prophets of deliverance are recalled by Micah. Those are Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Deliverance from 400 years of Egyptian oppression, abuse, and slavery is a powerful story that has shaped the identity of this nation for generations and continues to do so. The mere mention of this prophetic family trio of Moses, Aaron, and Miriam would evoke a deep and visceral memory of the people's 40-year journey back and forth across the wilderness and the way that story has been retold through the generations as Yahweh washed slavery off of their bodies, minds, and spirits, forming them into a nation of hope and a nation of purpose. I'm betting there wouldn't be a dry eye in the courtroom after everyone walked down that memory lane. And then after the Exodus flashback, Micah gets more specific. He reminds both the jury of creation and the nation of the accused, that is, God's people, of what happened in, as it is recorded in the 22nd chapter of the book of Numbers, when King Balak of Moab, in great fear of God's people, sought to pay off the prophet Balaam in order to curse the Israelites to give him some advantage. And as the story is told, including the story of a speaking donkey, as the story is told, it is a foreshadowing because Balaam, instead of cursing Israel, offers up a blessing for them. So this is a foreshadowing, I believe, of the way that this lawsuit is going to be decided. At least that's what Micah thinks. And so after Micah does this, the third part of his presentation, he enters the minds and the hearts of the accused. And in some ways he acknowledges the difficulties that they face. Now, these difficulties are predicated on a people who give lip service to God and who go through the motions of religion, though their hearts are deeply entwined with the superficiality of culture and empire. Burn offerings of calves and rams and rivers of oil without hearts attuned to faith are little more than a circus that does nothing more than entertain and numb the minds of the masses. 
one of the most unique things about this story and about Scripture and faith as a whole is that despite the language that defines this as a court case, Micah and especially Yahweh are not interested in conviction for the purpose of punishment. That's not how God works. God works by grace. Always has, always will. Which means that God seeks another meaning of the word conviction. You see, God wants the whole world to be convicted with a passion. A passion to do what God has always asked them to do. That's why the triple crown, three ways of doing, loving, and walking in verse 8, is offered right here in the middle of this convicting case. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? God's triple crown, do justice, love mercy, walk humbly, is a triple threat to empire and culture. But to those who are convicted with a passion, it is a triple crown of action, of doing, being, and journeying with God. I've always been fascinated by the role of three recurring characters in Scripture, not by name, but by title and task. Throughout Scripture, you find quite often prophets, priests, and kings. And we all know what kings do. They are the monarchs of empire that prod the people into service to nation, culture, and economy. Priests, on the other hand, are the ones who guide and direct the people in the ritual practice of religion as a means of learning about and practicing their faith in the real world day by day. And the third character, prophets. Those are the ones who speak divine truth to both empire and religion, that is, to king and priest, inviting everyone to move much deeper than lip service and mindless ritual. I will have to confess to you that one of the most challenging parts of being a pastor is learning how to faithfully balance the role of priest and prophet. Because you know nobody wants you to be a king. On the one hand, we are the choreographers of both grief and joy. Walking beside members of church and community as they traverse the mountains and the valleys of life. Birth, baptism, confirmation, marriage, and then unfortunately also divorce, illness, loneliness, brokenness, death, and contemplation of and preparation for what comes after that. Today's text, both the Matthew text and the Micah text, are ones that challenge me and both my priestly and prophetic roles. And sometimes that becomes a bit uncomfortable. You see, the priest in my heart wants to simply keep the liturgy, hold to the traditions, and make everyone feel warm and comfy. But the prophet in my bones makes me also want to bleed for the sake of love. And as a pastor and a preacher, I am compelled to engage them both. The Micah 6 passage, also one of my favorites, 
is the text that I chose to focus on today back a few months ago when worship was being planned. But when I woke up this past Thursday morning, something else came out of my fingertips. It is about the Matthew text, about what it means to be blessed. So I leave you with this. In Matthew's Beatitudes, there is no blessed are you whose larders are full, whose closets are packed, whose houses are sturdy, whose transportation is reliable, whose portfolios are healthy. There is, instead, a blessing for spiritual poverty, a blessing for mourning, meekness, a blessing for righteous hunger and thirst, a blessing for mercy and pure hearts, a blessing for peacemakers, and a blessing for the persecuted. If our determination of what blessing means comes by the measure of accomplishment, the mass of applause, and the math of accumulation, have we not lost every inkling of faith and been consumed instead by the small-mindedness of our culture? Do not money, real estate, and other tangible property define not what we're worth, but simply what we control? Isn't our worth a gift from God? A gift that enables us to ask ourselves what we're doing with what we control and for whom we're doing it. If we're not using what's within our reach to make the world a healthier place for all of those around us, creatures and creation, Haven't we surrendered God's gift and derailed the train of divine blessing? I am reminded of the Genesis story. In the 12th chapter of Genesis, when Abram first encountered God, God explained what blessing means with this simple statement. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to prepare to join me in our prayers of petition and intercession. Let us pray together. O God of prophets, priests, and kings, in this life we pray you'd help us do three things. In our prophetic role, all of our prophetic roles, give us passion to speak, not simply a wispy prognostication of what we would like to happen at some point in the future, but to speak the bold prophetic truth of your intentions for the thriving and care of the community of the entire cosmos in the here and now. God of mercy. Secondly, we ask that you would give us priestly compassion to weep, with those who grieve, to celebrate with those who rejoice, and to be a reflection of steadfast divine presence in the midst of all of life's journey. God of mercy. And thirdly, O God, we ask that you give us all royal courage to identify and move toward the places where our community's greatest needs intersect with our congregation's deepest resources. Where neighbor becomes 
not a theoretical construct, but a vibrant relationship. God of mercy, this day we lift up all people who are struggling to put one foot in front of another, even those who can't imagine doing that because they can't even get out of bed. Those whose medical journey is fraught with pitfalls and pharmaceutical derailments. Those who are facing or recovering from surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, or any other deeply challenging circumstances. God of mercy. We give you thanks for all people who have climbed a difficult medical mountain and now find themselves somewhere along the road to recovery. And we pray that you would continue to accompany them in the days, weeks, months, and years ahead. God of mercy. We pray for all people whose homes and neighborhoods have been wrecked by war, natural disaster, or some other catastrophic circumstances. Give us the courage to be present for and with them with all of the resources we can find. God of mercy. We give you thanks, dear Lord, for all the ways you walk with humanity along the journey of life, especially the way that you walk with all of us in the depths of destruction, discord, and despair. Help us to be both receptive to and cognizant of your accompaniment along every road and every day. God of mercy. Hear us now, O God, as we join our hearts and voices as we are able, praying the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to rise in body and or spirit as we prepare to confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us confess our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. 
As our ushers prepare to wait upon us this morning for the morning offering, I do remind folks that there, there are multiple ways to give. Uh, our ushers will be bringing by the offering bags. That's one way. Uh, but we also have offering plates uh, at the narthex and side entrances that can be used. Um, also, our online giving at www.firstpresgreenville.org. Uh, at the very, very top toward the right, uh, you'll, say, you'll see a, a, an actual tab that says Give Online. That's an option as well. And uh, there are also other places throughout the building where we have uh, QR codes on our screens that will help you get there and do that online as well uh, to make that a little more easier. Our ushers now wait upon us for the morning offering. Let us pray. Gracious God, you are the giver of all good gifts. Scripture tells us that the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. And we praise you this day for resources and life and talents and opportunities to be able to give in your kingdom. Bless all we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you as you are able to remain standing as we sing hymn number 372.
I charge you as those who have heard the good news this day to go out with the triple crown, the triple crown of doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with God, and let that be your guide in life. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Creator, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.